Chapter 42 Tradition This chapter is based on portions taken from Matthew chapter 15 and Mark chapter 7. The scribes and Pharisees expecting to see Jesus at the Passover had laid a trap for him, but Jesus, knowing their purpose, had absented himself from this gathering. Then came together unto him the Pharisees and certain of the scribes. As he did not go to them, they came to him. For a time it had seemed that the people of Galilee would receive Jesus as the Messiah, and that the power of the hierarchy in that region would be broken. The mission of the twelve, indicating the extension of Christ's work and bringing the disciples more directly into conflict with the rabbis, had excited anew the jealousy of the leaders at Jerusalem. The spies they sent to Capernaum in the early part of his ministry, who had tried to fix on him the charge of Sabbath-breaking, had been put to confusion. But the rabbis were bent on carrying out their purpose. Now another deputation was sent to watch his movements and find some accusation against him. As before, the ground of complaint was his disregard of the traditional precepts that encumbered the law of God. These were professedly designed to guard the observance of the law, but they were regarded as more sacred than the law itself. When they came in collision with the commandments given from Sinai, preference was given to the rabbinical precepts. Among the observances most strenuously enforced was that of ceremonial purification. The neglect of the forms to be observed before eating was accounted a heinous sin, to be punished both in this world and in the next, and it was regarded as a virtue to destroy the transgressor. The rules in regard to purification were numberless. The period of a lifetime was scarcely sufficient for one to learn them all. The life of those who tried to observe the rabbinical requirements was one long struggle against ceremonial defilement, an endless round of washings and purifications. While the people were occupied with trifling distinctions and observances which God had not required, their attention was turned away from the great principles of His law. Christ and His disciples did not observe these ceremonial washings, and the spies made this neglect the ground of their accusation. They did not, however, make a direct attack on Christ, but came to Him with criticism of His disciples. In the presence of the multitude they said, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. Whenever the message of truth comes home to souls with special power, Satan stirs up his agents to start a dispute over some minor question. Thus he seeks to attract attention from the real issue. Whenever a good work is begun, there are cavillers ready to enter into dispute over forms or technicalities, to draw minds away from the living realities. When it appears that God is about to work in a special manner for His people, let them not be enticed into a controversy that will work only ruin of souls. The questions that most concern us are, Do I believe with saving faith in the Son of God? Is my life in harmony with the divine law? He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life. And hereby we do know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. Jesus made no attempt to defend himself or his disciples. He made no reference to the charges against him, but proceeded to show the spirit that actuated these sticklers for human rights. He gave them an example of what they were repeatedly doing, and had done just before coming in search of him. Full well you reject the commandment of God, he said, that you may keep your own tradition. For Moses said, Honor thy father and thy mother, and whoso curses his father or mother, let him die the death. But you say, If a man shall say to his father or mother, It is Corban, that is to say, a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, he shall be free. And you suffer him no more to be aught for his father or his mother. 
They set aside the fifth commandment as of no consequence, but were very exact in carrying out the traditions of the elders. They taught the people that the devotion of their property to the temple was a duty more sacred than even the support of their parents, and that however great the necessity, it was sacrilege to impart to father or mother any part of what had been thus consecrated. An undutiful child had only to pronounce the word Corban over his property, thus devoting it to God, and he could retain it for his own use during his lifetime, and after his death it was to be appropriated to the temple service. Thus he was at liberty, both in life and in death, to dishonor and defraud his parents under cover of a pretended devotion to God. Never, by word or deed, did Jesus lessen man's obligation to present gifts and offerings to God. It was Christ who gave all the directions of the law in regard to tithes and offerings. When on earth he commended the poor woman who gave her all to the temple treasury. But the apparent zeal for God on the part of the priests and rabbis was a pretense to cover their desire for self-aggrandizement. The people were deceived by them. They were bearing heavy burdens which God had not imposed. Even the disciples of Christ were not wholly free from the yoke that had been bound upon them by inherited prejudice and rabbinical authority. Now, by revealing the true spirit of the rabbis, Jesus sought to free from the bondage of tradition all who were really desirous of serving God. You hypocrites, he said, addressing the wily spies. Well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. The words of Christ were an arraignment of the whole system of Phariseeism. He declared that by placing their requirements above the divine precepts, the rabbis were setting themselves above God. The deputies from Jerusalem were filled with rage. They could not accuse Christ as a violator of the law given from Sinai, for he spoke as its defender against their traditions. The great precepts of the law which he had presented appeared in striking contrast to the petty rules that men had devised. To the multitude, and afterward more fully to his disciples, Jesus explained that defilement comes not from without, but from within. Purity and impurity pertain to the soul. It is the evil deed, the evil word, the evil thought, the transgression of the law of God, not the neglect of external man-made ceremonies that defiles a man. The disciples noted the rage of the spies as their false teaching was exposed. They saw the angry looks and heard the half-muttered words of dissatisfaction and revenge. Forgetting how often Christ had given evidence that he read the heart as an open book, they told him of the effect of his words. Hoping that he might conciliate the enraged officials, they said to Jesus, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended, after they heard this saying? He answered, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. The customs and traditions so highly valued by the rabbis were of this world, not from heaven. However great their authority with the people, they could not endure the testing of God. Every human invention that has been substituted for the commandments of God will be found worthless in that day when God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. The substitution of the precepts of men for the commandments of God has not ceased. Even among Christians are found institutions and usages that have no better foundation than the tradition of the fathers. Such institutions resting upon mere human authority have supplanted those of divine appointment. Men cling to their traditions and revere their customs and cherish hatred against those who seek to show them their error. 
In this day, when we are bidden to call attention to the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, we see the same enmity as was manifested in the days of Christ. Of the remnant people of God, it is written, The dragon was wroth with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. But every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. In place of the authority of the so-called fathers of the church, God bids us accept the word of the Eternal Father, the Lord of heaven and earth. Here alone is truth unmixed with error. David said, I have more understanding than all my teachers, for thy testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients, because I keep thy precepts. Let all who accept human authority, the customs of the church, or the traditions of the fathers, take heed to the warning conveyed in the words of Christ. In vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men.